certain parts of energy and help refresh certain aspects of it. This is not going to work. I like how we're seeing the computer screen, but I'm not seeing the computer screen at all. That's kind of cool. That's, well, that's how that works. I think the monitor's actually off is what the deal is. Okay. All right. So we're recording. I've got the document camera. It looks like you guys can see the document camera over there. Okay. So we're going to start out with a problem. I'm going to write it out. We've got a 2,000 kilogram pile driver. And I'll describe a pile driver here to you in just a second. Is used to drive an I-beam into the ground. The pile driver falls five meters before hitting the beam. And when it does, and when it dry, and it's going to ultimately drive the beam 12 centimeters into the ground. Okay. So most people have seen a pile driver, they just don't know they've seen a pile driver. We've got a big industrial type hammer. And they take it and they're going to drive an I-beam or a piece of retaining metal or a variety of things. And what we're told is that this is going to be five meters off the ground. And then after it hits, we're going to drop the, this beam is going to sink into the ground 0.12 meters. So that's our situation. So initially, We've got a 2,000 kilogram pile driver. It's going to drive the I beam in the ground. It's going to fall five meters before hitting the beam. And then we're going to push that beam into the ground. So one of the first things we can do when we look at this is look at the potential energy or our change in potential energy or our work to get the beam to where it starts. So that's just going to be MGH. And that's going to be our 2,000 kilograms times our 9.8 meters per second squared times our height, which is 5 meters. And that's going to give me 98,000 newton meters, but it's going to give me, because this is a newton meter that ends up in being an energy, it's going to give me a joule. So we're going to put 98,000 joules of energy into the system that's going to be available to do work. And the work that we're actually going to do is we're going to push this bottom beam into the ground and push it, push it down. So one of the things we usually want to find out is what's the velocity just as it hits the beam, okay? So if we know that, we know that we put 98,000 joules and we're dealing from here being our zero point and that's going to be crucial here in a little bit that that's from our zero point we know that this is going to be one half mv squared and if i do this i get two times my ninety-eight thousand joules and that's going to end up being 98 meters squared per second squared divided by the mass which was two thousand kilograms and then if I go ahead and do and that's V squared so V ends up being 9.9 .9 meters per second so we can do that part of the problem but the next question might be what's the force that this beam applies to the pile 
as it's being as it's as it's hitting down each time. So we want to know that resistive force that's being in there. And this is where things like the work energy theorem come into play. Okay? The work energy theorem comes into play because the work in this case is going to equal our change in potential energy plus our change in kinetic energy plus any dissipative or non conservative forces like heat, sound, whatever. But we can make the assumption that the losses are going to be small in comparison to everything else. So we can go back in here and look at the change in kinetic energy. So the kinetic energy at the start are equal to zero is equal to zero because it's not moving. The kinetic energy down here is also equal to zero because it stopped once it hits the ground or once it finally finishes doing its job. It's, it's kinetic energy down there is equal to zero. So my change in kinetic energy in this case is zero. We're going to make the assumption that I'm not going to worry about any dissip uh, dissipated forces. So the work that's going to be done is my change in potential energy. Okay. The work that's going to be done is that change in potential energy. Now, the interesting part about this is that my work is going to be the force times the distance that it moves. But because this force is opposite that force, we're going to actually do a negative sign because we're looking at it from this perspective. And you'll see that here in just a second with the change in potential energy. So I've got that, that aspect of it. So what I end up with is that this force is the force of the beam, which is acting against the pile. And so I'm going to get a negative force, which is what we're looking for. The distance that we're worried about is the 0.12 meters when I'm looking at the work side of the equation. And on the other side, I get mass times gravity, height final minus height initial. This gets us to what we talked about on Friday about a state function. We only worry about where we start. and where we finish. Just like Hess's law in chemistry. We only worry about where we start and where we finish. So now I'm going to end up with an equation that looks like this, negative force. I'm going to have my 0.12 meters. I've got my mass, which is 2,000 kilograms. I have 9.8 meters per second squared. My final height is a negative 0.12 because it's below the point where I said I was zero. And my initial height was five meters. So now if I plug this in, I end up with 2,000 kilograms. 9.8 meters per second squared, a negative 5.12 meters is going to equal the negative force 0.12 meters. That negative and this negative cancel each other out, so my force is going to end up being 2,000, 9.8, 5.12, divided by 0 0.12, and this ends up being, if this is kilogram meters per second squared is in Newton, that's meters, that's meters, I end up in Newtons, so I've set up my, my problem correctly. And when I plug that in the calculator, I get something like 8.4 times 10 to the fifth Newtons. So kind of
of a good constructive civil engineering type problem because people use pile drivers to do a lot of driving beams into systems, a lot of compacting of soils, a lot of different aspects. We use pile drivers in order to do work for us. Now, did I do the height problem at the end of the slide? I thought I did. I thought I did the height problem at the end of the slide. I think we did it in the pool. Didn't I do the pool problem? Where we? Yep, yep, I did the pool problem. Okay. Did the pool problem. I wasn't 100% sure, so I wanted to make sure. All right. So we're going to introduce something a little different. We're going to introduce another concept. And that concept is power. Power is defined by work divided by time. So it's the work that you do over time. So our units are joules per second, and that's defined as a watt. Okay, so if we think about this, we use cranes all the time, right? And we've got a 1,000 kilogram mass, and we're told that our crane is rated at 500 watts. We want to know how long does it take to lift our 1,000 kilogram object five meters at full power. So we're told that work, our power is equal to work divided by time. Time is what we're looking for. So I'm going to rearrange this so that I've got time is work divided by power. But the work that's being done in this case is lifting our 10 or 1,000 kilogram mass 5 meters. So that's pretty good. So I can just do MGH divided by my power. And that's going to be my 1,000 kilograms, 9.8 meters per second squared, 5 meters, divided by are 500 watts. So if I plug that into the calculator, I end up getting 98 somethings. So I have kilograms, meters, seconds squared, meters, divided by watts, which is a joule second. So now I get kilograms, meters, squared, seconds squared, and I get joule seconds. So one of those seconds cancels. I've got kilogram meters per second, and I got a joule, and my joule is a kilogram meters squared, seconds squared. So I end up losing another second there. I end up losing my kilogram meter squared. Now I have one over one over seconds. So this ends up being seconds. So it's 98 seconds, or it's gonna take it 1.6 minutes.
I don't know. I don't do cranes. <laughs> but I do want to talk about where these lovely things come from. So power, the whole reason we have power is because basically what we had big old wheel here of a coal bucket okay and so this is an artifact of history we use little ponies actually they weren't little ponies we used draft ponies about the size of a halflinger if you've ever seen a halflinger or a gypsy vanny no not a, Shet not a shetland shetlands are little ponies Little ponies, not a little pony, and we're talking, we're talking a pony that's like a halflinger, um, gypsy vanner pony, not a gypsy vanner horse, gypsy vanner horses are the big drum horses, we're talking a pony, they're probably about 13 and a half hands tall, pretty stout, pulling critters, so you're using a pony, and the idea is that this pony would lift a coal bucket. And these poor little ponies are out there lifting these coal buckets normally on a day. And, and they wanted to compare the pony with a steam engine to find out how much work that the steam engine could do over the course of a day compared to our little coal ponies to be able to, to do that. And they actually went out and I actually looked it up and went back and figured out exactly how many ponies they averaged over time to be able to come up with this particular measure. And the actual measure, our first measure of power was referred to as horsepower. Good old horsepower. And then they wanted to compare horsepower and that horsepower is based off of a draft pony, not based off of a horse, by the way, based off a draft pony, um, that that horsepower is actually equal to about 700, if I remember it correctly, about 746 watts. So that's where the fun conversion comes from, is that it's the amount of work that that poor pony can do over the course of a working day, which is where you end up in that work per unit time. And the comparison was how much could I get a steam engine to do in comparison to the pony, and that's where we end up with this lovely comparison. So watts are British units. Um, and you can actually get horsepower, and we still talk about horsepower, but it's about 746 watts. So it's just one horsepower, one it's horsepower is... 746 watts. It's about that. So when they say a certain amount of horsepower, what they're really referring to is that the people who don't know horsepower are going to compare to watts. Right. Okay. Yeah, so, and, and we still use horsepower because, guess what? The idea and the reason we use it is... When we started back in around 1910, we were comparing how fast a car could go versus a team of horses, right? I mean, that's exactly what we were doing. You were comparing, you were comparing mechanical devices to horses because our horses or oxen were mechanical devices. And that's where, you know, you can still, you can still look at it. But that's also why I always laugh because one horsepower is not necessarily one horse you know one horsepower not necessarily one horse and if you've ever seen and and i've ever had a pulling pony versus a regular say quarter horse or something like that a pulling pony can definitely move a heck of a lot of stuff over a certain period of time so that but that's where our lovely units come from in horsepower and watts so horsepower is one of those interesting interesting pieces that we look at. Now, horsepower and watts, so watts is our lovely unit of energy per time. So go back to looking at watts. Watts are, it's the energy per unit time. So if I take watts times time, I'm gonna get some sort of an energy value. 
right? I'm going to get some sort of an energy value. And that energy value is usually, we, if we're using SI units, that's a joule. If we're using good old English units and the units that we typically see, we see watt hours. But that's not usually how our bill comes in. Our bill usually comes in kilowatt hours, and that is a unit of energy. So when we're dealing with electricity, when we're dealing with a variety of things, we're buying our energy in terms of kilowatt hours. Now there's another energy unit out there. Okay, there's another energy unit out there. And that's the British thermal unit. It's a BTU. And we usually use BTUs when we deal with heat. But if I'm using SI, that's also joules. So I have a variety of different units that are at our disposal and BTUs become very important when I'm dealing with things that are going to generate heat. So let's kind of look at a couple of things real quick. I've got a question. Mm -hmm. I'm just confused a little. Uh, the question before the, when you talked about 500 watts and 1,000 kilograms thing, mm -hmm. is that a real thing or is like, because I'm just confused if one horsepower is 743 or 46. Yeah, a 500 watt engine is okay. Okay, so is that... It's not possible for a horse to lift that, but... Yeah, it is. It is? 1,000 kilograms? Yeah. I cannot pull it. It's not going to be as heavy as it would be in real life. They'll pull it. Okay. They'll pull it. They may not get it very far. <laughs> but yeah, they can do it. And those of us who've had pulling ponies move stuff, and my favorite part of the fair is watching draft, draft horse pulls. Well, think about it. As I noticed as I was grading stuff, I didn't get very many world's strongest men pulls, did I? Not too many of you turn one in. But if I do, if I watch the world's strongest man, he's actually doing depending on which place we're at, right? Depending on which place we're at. Well, it depends on which one you got. I've got the guy pulling a train, right? Well, there's a train. Actually, there's one that's pretty cool. He's pulling two 747s. You know, they do some really bizarre stuff. And you're talking a guy pulling one of those. Right? You're not going to guy pulling one of those. And the trick to pulling any of it isn't once it gets moving. The trick is to get it moving. That's the trick. You know, that goes back to our impulse issue, right? There's my impulse. It's force per unit time, which is going to end up being my change in momentum. And this is the trick for my world's smaller, strongest man pull no matter what it is. It's also the trick for any draft horse pull. And my favorite this time of year is, um, oh, there were actually two of them here recently. There's a, there's a video that goes around up in Pennsylvania where the milk, the milk truck comes in to the local dairies and collects the milk and the Amish have to use their draft teams to pull the milk truck, the semi truck out of the snow bank because they've got a pair of draft horses around that they can actually get traction. This year on the Great Lakes, if you are doing snow, um, doing ice fishing, the snow was so deep that they couldn't get their trucks out onto the ice to remove them by March 1st. March 1st is the day that you're supposed to get your ice houses off the lake so that you don't lose the ice houses into the lake. Well, they couldn't get them off this year because the snow was too deep to get their trucks out. So what do they have to do? They hired Amish horse teams to come out and pull their, their ice houses off, off the ice. So, that, you know, the, Horses, horses can do, but if you think about it, world's strongest man, and, and these things aren't shabby. Um, in train engines, they're about 20,000 kilograms. Yeah, yeah. 
It's, so, I mean, they, 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 you, once you, the trick isn't keeping it moving. The trick is getting it moving. So, and here is your... Um, here is your trivia question of the day. So everybody knows Golden Spike, right? And we've all seen the picture of Golden Spike. You have one train that looks like this. And cattle catcher, right? Look at the cattle catcher. Yes, I can draw train engines pretty well. I like my train engines. And on the other side, we didn't have quite the kind of cattle catcher. But we had another train that had this kind of stack. So I got those two types of trains. I can tell you from that picture which train is using which fuel source. One's using wood as a fuel source, and one's using coal as a fuel source. The left is coal. The left is coal. Well, and no. This one's cold. Right's cold. <laughs> Sorry, right's cold. The left is not cold. I was looking at the picture the other way, so I was turned around. This one's cold. And this one's wood. Anybody know why I can tell that? Yeah. The bill shape uh -huh. pipe is a spark arrestor. The bell shaped pipe is a spark arrestor. Yep, that is a spark arrestor. So you can actually look at the old timey photographs and you can tell which one is gonna be coal fired, which one is, they're both steam engines, they're both steam locomotives, but this one's gonna be wood fired, that one's gonna be coal fired, and I don't have to see the car behind them to be able to tell which way it is. Except one thing. It, and then that gets us to where I was going with BTUs. That was a good segue. That was an absolutely good segue. All right, because let's think of BTUs. And this is why we get BTUs, right? This comes up with why we get BTUs. So if we're looking at energy, so I can have energy and if anybody burns wood for any kind of heating, right? If I'm doing wood for any kind of heating, around here we've got good old cottonwood we have oak. Some places you can get walnut. And then we can get stuff like, um, you know, we can get a bunch of other, uh, other different pieces. Which one of those three do I really want to burn, provided I don't use it for lumber, because it's a crime if I've got a good piece to use for lumber. Oh, I can also use pine. Don't like using pine, but I can also use pine. Which one of those do I want to burn for good heat value? Oak is a good one. Oak is certainly better than cottonwood and pine. Walnut really is nice if you want good heat value. But again, you know, you'd also, if I'm, if I'm a woodworker, I'd rather use my walnut for something else other than just good old fuel. Because what we talk about, we talk about something called energy density. Okay. Oak or cottonwood and pine are going to burn bright and fast. Oak is going to be a little slower going and it's going to, and it's going to burn a lot hotter. These are going to not burn quite so hot and walnut burns hotter than, than oak does. And you can actually look up the BTU value for a standard amount of walnut, oak, cottonwood, or pine. This gets us to the conversation about E10, okay? So a typical gallon of gasoline, which is based off of octane, which is a C10 mixture, so it's a, it's a hydrocarbon, not C10, sorry, octane C8. I was thinking c -tane. c -tane is where we get for diesel. Diesel is C10, so diesel. So I get diesel and, and uh, octane. Kerosene is kind of right in here as well. Okay, kerosene, kerosene is also gonna be jet fuel. So I can have jet fuel. So 
each one of these has a specific energy density. How much energy or how many miles per gallon you're going to be able to get out of it in a standard engine. Now your miles per gallon for your various, various vehicles are going to be a little different. But each one of these has a specific energy density. I can look at ethanol and the energy density of ethanol is much less than that of gasoline. So if I add more ethanol, guess how many miles per gallon I'm going to get? I'm going to get lesser miles per gallon. So the energy density for each one of these is going to be different and that's where we start comparing in terms of British thermal units. So if I throw in coal in here, coal, and actually if you listen to old-timey radio, they actually talk about anthracite coal versus other coal. Anthracite coal had a much better energy density than coal, say, from, some pla from other places. So you can actually look at energy density to be able to say which one is going to be a better fuel for whatever it is you're doing. Natural gas is another one, and my natural gas, of course, it's going to have methane. And this also comes into play when I'm dealing with my, my energy density, the difference between propane and butane and, and ethane and methane, all of those different ones are going to have different energy densities which come back to the British thermal unit value. Because the idea is if I'm driving a steam engine, I want to know how much energy I'm going to get out of a lump of coal versus wood in order to keep my steam engine going. So which one's more efficient may be a little bit of a different question based off of the energy that we got. Now the engine itself, the steam engine itself, is going to have an efficiency. It doesn't care. Once I get the water boiling, how much work the engine's going to do is one thing. But to get the water boiling and what energy I'm using to get the water boiling is going to be something totally different. So practical problems associated with BTUs in history lessons. So let's look at energy usage. All right, so let's look at energy uses. Even though I do this problem, we'll see it again. A typical incandescent light bulb, I'm being very specific, incandescent light bulbs, you can't get very many of them anymore. Typical incandescent light bulb. This is the light bulb that had a nice little filament in here that glowed and we have it in our little light bulby thing there. And typically for a specific brightness in an incandescent light bulb, it was 60 watts. Brightness and, and power are not actually measured in the same way. Brightness is actually measured with a unit called lumens. Okay. Brightness is actually comes from lumens, but we got into the habit because incandescent light bulbs were ubiquitous. We knew what, how, about how bright a 60 watt light bulb was. We knew about how bright a 40 watt light bulb was. We know about how bright a 90 watt light bulb is. Okay, but that's not really the case. I can get the same brightness out of an LED using about 10 watts. I can get the same brightness out of a compact fluorescent using about 14 watts. It also has a couple other advantages. A typical 60 watt incandescent light bulb had a lifetime of about 1200 hours. And that's if you were really, really good. Because if you ever had an incandescent light bulb sitting on an end table and you bumped the end table, what happened to your light bulb? It usually went poof. If you had dogs that went running through the house or a cat, poof. Because these, in, these filaments are very, very fragile, and when they get hot, they break very easily. So if you could actually get 1,200 hours out of an incandescent light bulb, more power to you. 
more power to you. Typical life, uh, life expectancy on an LED, 50,000 hours. Typical on a compact fluorescent, about 10,000 hours. I mean, so you can do, and so if you look at the energy usage, so if I want to burn the 60 watt light bulb for 1200 hours, I'm going to take my 60 watts, and I'm going to put in my time, my 1200 hours. That's 72,000 watt hours or it's 72 kilowatt hours. Typical price of electricity, about 12 cents per kilowatt hour. So this was actually gonna cost you $8.64 to operate. For one light bulb. Over its course of its life. If I do the same, and I do 10 watts for 1200 hours, that's going to be 12,000. That's going to be 12 kilowatt hours. A dollar forty four. So you can see why, from an energy efficiency point of view, they wanted to get rid of incandescent light bulbs. Does anybody know why, other than the price? Because material, just, uh huh? Material using is it platinum or titanium? Well. Well, it actually, you can um, see if I don't have my notes on this one. The, at the time, I actually do put together a value. These To buy a 60-watt light bulb would probably cost you about 75 cents. To buy a comparable LED to give you the same lumens at the time was going to cost you about 6 bucks to do it. But even though I, and, and at the time, if you do it over the course of the lifetime, it would take you 42 LED or 42 um, incandescent light bulbs to get you one LED. This will cost you over its life about, you know, about 10 bucks. This one will cost you over its life about 385 bucks when you throw in the cost of uh, the cost of the light bulbs. And so the question always comes down to why were we so reluctant to switch over to LEDs and compact fluorescents? Because we were. And I will tell you, even I doing the, doing the calculations over and over and over again was a very late adopter of LEDs. I hated them. I don't like the color. It's color. The new ones are not so bad. And what, complex fluorescents were easy for people to understand because of the flicker. Because the way, that, the way a compact fluorescent operates um, it, it's, you know, if you get one of these lights start to go out and you get a flicker, that would drive people crazy. So, I mean, fluorescent light bulbs, we've had a problem with the flicker for a long time. So flicker was an issue for the compact fluorescents. But the LEDs up until about two years ago were harsh on the eye, were very, very harsh on the eye. It made it really difficult to read, made it really difficult. So depending on what application I was using an LED for, depended on whether or not I was willing to give up my incandescent light bulb. And there are still some incandescent light bulbs we don't want to give up. Um, if I'm using that incandescent light bulb for a heat generation, I certainly don't want to give it up because I'm not generating a whole heck of a lot of heat out of an LED. So if I have lizards, if I have chicks, I have um, baby duckies, you know, and I'm using it for heat lamps, I'm wanting an incandescent light bulb because I want that heat that's being generated. I'm using that, that resistance heating to help me. But for a long time, those LEDs were, and, and I hate the halogens. 
Those are so harsh on the, on the eye, and everybody can tell who's got a halogen headlight because, I mean, they kill you. Um, and LEDs also don't have the same diffusion that my good old incandescents would have in the past. So we could have a lot of different things. All right, so Wednesday we'll still continue with energy, but now you got your history lesson, your economics lesson, <laughs> units lesson. I need to go back and change all my lifestyle. I save myself a lot of money. Uh, yeah, you will. <laughs>